It's Sunday, April 14th, the day of the Iranian regime's unprecedented attack on Israel. So what happened and what happens next? We'll get an update direct from the IDF and then break it all down with defense analyst Yaakov Katz. Keeping you up to date, I'm Michael Dixon, and this is Stand With Us TV Live. Shalom, we're live from Israel. It was an unprecedented attack from the brutal regime in Iran. Instead of using proxies, over 170 deadly drones, 120 surface-to-surface ballistic missiles, and over 30 cruise missiles were fired towards Israel from Iranian soil itself. And as this happened, Iran's proxies Hezbollah, the Houthis, Hamas, and others joined in the attack as well. Israel's home front command issued cancellations for schools, kindergartens, and large gatherings as Israelis like my own family braced for the attack. When it came, it triggered 692 red alert sirens in Israel, but miraculously, every missile was intercepted with a stunning 99% accuracy rate. The only serious injury we know of is that of Amina, a seven-year-old Bedouin girl who was hit and seriously injured by shrapnel from an intercepted Iranian projectile, and may she heal quickly. And dozens of Israelis were treated for lighter injuries and shock. So a miracle, yes, but a terrifying set of circumstances and an intolerable situation for millions of Israeli families. And in the words of Israel's President Herzog, a declaration of war. Much of the world has condemned Iran, and it's a tense and worrying time for all those around the world who care about the Jewish state in its battle against evil. Once again, a David versus Goliath battle is playing out in the Middle East, and Israel facing the Iranian regime, its allies and multiple proxies on all fronts, is David. Let's get the latest now. Joining me live is IDF International Spokesperson, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner. Lieutenant Colonel, Thank you for joining us once again. Shalom, Michael. Good evening. Let me begin by just showing a video that the Islamic Republic regime in Iran put out showing the amount of firepower it aimed towards Israel. So talk us through the attack and why it was so unprecedented. Um, It was unprecedented, Michael, precisely because it was the first time Iran had directly attacked Israel. It was unprecedented because of the types of weaponry uh, and the extent of their weapons that they attacked us by. And it was unprecedented also because of how we responded. So when we look at the magnitude of Iran's attack, as you're figures rightly pointed out, the 170 drones, explosive drones, suicide drones um, that made the way from Iran, from Iraq, um, in order to attack us, um, it was unprecedented. I would say, and, and what we know today is that none of them actually were able to reach Israel. They were all shot down in the course of their, their way to, on their way to, in mid-flight. Um, it was unprecedented because 120 ballistic missiles in one Slavo was fired at Israel. Um, again, only a handful of those were acting and hitting Israel. Um, it was unprecedented because of the 30 cruise missiles that came across as well. So when we look at the magnitude of the attack, when we look at how um, Iran tried to, tried to fool us, um, it was unprecedented. Uh, I think, though, that what is more important... Um, yeah, sorry, you wanted to ask something there. No, go ahead. You tell us. 
Yeah, I think what what is you know, more important actually than than the failure of Iran in this in this attack is how Israel, uh, under the umbrella of the United States Central Command, together with Britain and France and regional players as well, came together in a unified um, alliance, a coalition of decent people that are set against Iran and their diabolical ideas. So I think what is actually a, a good omen from this terrible day and terrible night, there are so many people, I can imagine your family and my family, we were all, you know, up at night thinking about, worried about what, what are we doing? And, and I, when I got called into the, into the unit, then, then obviously I knew that things were going to happen. Um, and, and as the, the realization of those players coming together to come to our assistance, to send a clear message to Iran, I think it's actually, it's both heartwarming, but also very reassuring that if push comes to shove against an, a, a, another hostile Iran in the future, then we won't be alone. Um, we have worked to build this coalition. We've worked to be part of this coalition. Um, and I think that it, it is a realization of all of the players um, that Iran is a very negative uh, regime with fingers in everything destabilizing in this region, uh, whether it's from Hamas, whether it's the Houthis that are disrupting the shipping routes, or if it's Hezbollah, their, their forward division on Israel's border, um, whether it's the Iraqi uh, militias, all of those that have been equipped, that have been financed, that have been indoctrinated, that have been used as puppets by their puppet master Iran, um, have a very, very clear understanding today that Israel is not alone. And this is an unprecedented attack, we said, but it's also the kind of attack that the IDF drills for, even though it was the largest missile and drone attack in history. Tell us a bit about those preparations and the coordination with allies before this happened. I think the most uh, clear reality is that in the days leading up to uh, this attack, um, the chief of the, the the central command, the U.S. central command, was actually in Israel, and we ironed out the operational plans, the defensive elements, uh, the offensive elements as well, and who uh, distributing the different forces, which where each force will operate from, what are the boundaries and the expectations, and I think that was very very much of the reason it was so successful. Ninety nine percent interception rate that is unbelievable that is really extra extraordinary and you can only achieve such a, an, a a great success when we work together when we work together with very strong allies and regional allies where everybody has a mutual interest to defeat iran um i think that you know you, you rightly said this is not a uh, this is not a scenario israel did not expect or did not plan for the war games from when i was back in regular service we're all around what happens if in a, in a mass attack of rockets. But of course, the operational plans have evolved very, very much so in the last um, seven years. Uh, and so today, when I, when I saw the realization of those plans and the operations as the aerial defense array ca came together, um, uh, recruited in a, a few days beforehand into the reserves, uh, where the Arrow 2, Arrow 3 uh, were operational, where uh, the Iron Dome, everything was in sync and everything worked, I think, like clockwork. I think that is very, very reassuring in a time where we're still licking the wounds from the October 7th massacre. And I'm sure, obviously, the IDF is happy about its response to this attack. But let's be clear, this was intended to be much more devastating and deadly. Those are weapons that can do serious damage. Uh, 60 tons of explosives uh, was deployed by Iran in their attack. One of their ballistic missiles, just one of them, carries a payload of 100 to 120 kilograms uh, of, of, of explosives. So if they would have been successful in their diabolic plan, it would have been devastating for Israel. I think this is uh, perhaps we, we overlook it because today we are breathing quite easily, we're looking up to the sky, you know, things seem back to normal as, as normal things can get in a state of war. 
Uh, but it is not by mistake. It's not only a miracle. It's the men and women on the forefront of our defense system from the Air Force through to the aerial defense, through to the Home Front Command. Everything worked. I think even the actions that the IDF spokesperson conducted in the days leading up to the attack, reassuring, but informative, trying to maintain calm, because it is a very, there's a very, very narrow line between calm and panic uh, mm. when, uh, when war is impending and we don't know how it's going to develop and we don't know what, how successful Iran will be. And there are very many, many, many clear questions that could be asked into the development of this reality. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm confident, but I don't want to be too hyperbolic. I think we need to be very modest in how we amplify the success. It was a success on uh, the coalition building. It was a success operationally because, you know, Israel is a very small country. Our airspace is very tight and with so much weaponry and, mu and airplanes and, 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 and uh, and interceptors and, and rockets and drones that are flying in each and every way. The fact that we were able to have that coordinated in a way which saved Israeli lives is extraordinary, but we have to be, I think, modest and look forward to what happens if it happens again. What will the magnitude be? Uh, how, ca how can we move forward? Um, and, and what is, I think, what is is going to happen in the next few days is we'll see what the government decides with regard to is Israel responding, how Israel is going to respond, um, the pros and cons for that. Uh, and, and it's not an easy decision. I don't envy them. Um, uh, but Israel needs to be prepared for any eventuality. And the framing of the recent conflict in global media has been Israel versus Hamas, Israel versus Hezbollah in the north, Israel versus the Houthis. But the world can surely see now, as I said in my opening, it all comes down to Iran at the end of the day, doesn't it? Absolutely. I don't think that's me. No, we can hear you fine. You can hear me fine? Yes. Um, I think what we, I would say throughout the course of today, I've done probably something like 16 or 17 interviews on the world's leading media. Everybody was talking about the role of Iran. Everybody was talking about the extent of Iran's influence. Everyone was talking about uh, what happens next with Iran. So I think that um, it, it today was, today Iran in their actions brought themselves from the backstage where they've been the puppet master without this face to right front and center, right at the front of the stage, taking a bow of shame to all of the world after they did what they did. Uh, and so when we are looking at these hostile players, um, Iran and its proxies in the region, I think the, the world will be a lot more skeptical at accepting what they say, because who's running the show? And also they will uh, be questioning uh, motivations um, and intentions and if Israel, together with regional players and uh, Euro strong European players like France and slight, like the UK, um, Great Britain, and of course, under the American umbrella, can all come together, then people re realize that there is actually something very wrong um, in what's going on. Uh, they made a mistake clearly by stepping up to the front. And Lieutenant Colonel, those supporting the Iranian regime have made the claim that, uh, you know, th they're action was justified, this attack, uh, following the targeting of Iran's most senior military figure in Syria, Mohammed Reza Zahedi. Um, he was involved in the planning of the October 7th massacre in what they say was an embassy. Your response? So it, the IDF hasn't commented and will not comment on the specifics of that day. Uh, we know that Iran and the hostilities of Iran did not begin on April 1st. They've had their fingers in, they have built uh, Hamas, uh, with $200 million a year. They've built Hezbollah with $800 million a year, with training, with financing, with the equipping, uh, with instructions. They've given the Houthis instructions to intercept the cargo ships on uh, en route in the Red Sea or in the Hormuz, the Straits of Hormuz. Um, and, and so 
Iran has a has a very there's a very clear sense that Iran cannot enjoy anymore the privilege of being behind the scenes if they want to uh, uh, conduct such a uh, aggression against Israel then there's going to be a price for them to pay and so what are the current guidelines now for Israeli citizens and Passover is coming up we're expecting an uptick in tourism so what can people expect so actually, I was looking to uh, to try and take a vacation over the next weekend as well. Deserve it. So I, I, I'm really hoping that the, the Home Front Command will restore back to normal uh, uh, situation um, in the, probably in the next 24 hours. They've extended the, the, the instructions, limiting the congregation of a thousand people and advising people to be adjacent to um, uh, shelters. I think that's a wise decision at this stage. Um, but it, we are the finger on, on the pulse and checking intelligence and operational realities on the ground. Um, I think that's a good uh, situation to be in as we speak. Um, and as I said, I hope that by the end of the weekend, things will be back to normal and I will be able to get away for a couple of days. And meanwhile, lest we forget, we have 133 hostages and a continued threat still in Gaza. So how is Israel continuing to fend off Hamas? So we heard today that the Mossad um, via the Prime Minister's office announced that Hamas had d uh, turned down the offer that was on the table uh, for a hostage release. Um, this, is a, this is a sad reality. There are two ways basically to bring back hostages, either through negotiations like we did at the end of November, where we brought back 110, or through military action on the ground, as we did six weeks ago in Rafah, where we brought back two hostages alive. And in, this, in the aftermath of that, in the extraction of those hostages, uh, we came under extremely heavy fire. So I would say we need to create the conditions to bring hostages home, either operationally or through negotiations. Um, we understand and we know that hostages are being held in the Rafah area. We understand that Hamas's battalions in Rafah, in the south, the four battalions under the, the Rafah Brigade, uh, remain intact. And for us to achieve the both, both goals of this war in, against Hamas, uh, of dismantling and destroying Hamas as a governing entity, uh, terrorist authority in, in the Gaza Strip, and bringing the 133 hostages home, every last one of them, uh, that path goes through Rafah. Uh, I, I think that is, you know, it is, is right at the center of the IDF uh, operations as we speak. Uh, over the last 24 hours, 48 hours actually, the IDF has been operating in the area in the central Gaza Strip near Nusrat, continuing um, to pursue Hamas in their bunkers beneath the ground, engaging them above ground. Um, and indeed, uh, as we announced today, we are recruiting two more brigades, two more re reserve brigades to contribute further to the war effort against Hamas. Um, this war can be over to today if Hamas surrendered and released the 133 hostages. Unfortunately, we both know that they're not going to do that. Yeah. And uh, so you've been going from interview to interview across all the international media. So finally, what is your key message to our Stand With Us audience at this time? Uh, the key message is um, we are right in what we're doing. We have a right to defend ourselves. We have to do it in a way which is in accordance to international humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict. But I would say that we will defeat Hamas, bring home the hostages, um, and restore safety and security to the people of Israel. Well, we wish every success to the IDF. Thank you very much for joining us, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Have a good evening. Thank you. And coming up a little later, a very special video presentation featuring the late, great Rabbi Sachs. So stay with us. And if you appreciate the work of Stand With Us, please do consider supporting us now more than ever. Head to standwithus.com slash donate. Thank you very much. Now, to help us analyze this attack and the broader conflict, let's bring in our next guest. He's an Israeli-American author 
and journalist, a former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, where he continues to write a popular weekly column. He writes regularly for Newsweek, and he's the author of three books, Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power, Weapon Wizards, How Israel Became a High-Tech Military Superpower, and Israel versus Iran, the Shadow War. So no better person to join us at this time than Yaakov Katz. Yaakov, thank you very much for being with us on Stand With Us TV. Great to be with you, Michael. So it was a tense night for us Israelis. I hope you and your family are okay. How were they during all of this? It was, no one slept here most of the night. And I, you know, I'm sure that what happened to me and my kids was probably not that much different than probably millions of other parents around the country. I have four children. Uh, both of our daughters actually uh, served together in the IDF, uh, your daughter and my daughter. That's um, correct. We've we had the opportunity to meet at uh, different military ceremonies over the last uh, two years almost. But um, two of my kids, my middle, my younger children came to me at about 1.30 in the morning and said to me, Abba, you know, dad, do you think that the Iranians are going to kill us? And, you know, this was as the drones were making their way. And, and it was like, you know, it was surreal in the sense that we saw these, we were told by the IDF that this attack was happening. We were told that the drones and the cruise missiles and the ballistic missiles were making their way towards Israel. And, and you know, I saw in, in real, I, I was not worried of about our physical state, but but imagine what this does to these children and the trauma of what all Israelis and all Israeli kids went through over the last 24 hours. And to some extent, I say, you know, we're blessed that we live in Jerusalem. We're relatively safe. We have an experience with the people of the Gaza envelope have experienced over the last 20 plus years, or the people in the north have been experiencing. But we all have to agree that this is not a normal situation and no country should have to live the way that Israel has been uh, living over the last six months. And, and, and just one last word, so people, I think, fully understand this. You know, people tend to look at the world today and they say, look, the most threatened country is Ukraine. It's attacked by Russia. And my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine. But when I think about Israel for a moment, Israel is under attack from Hamas in Gaza. Israel is under daily attack from Hezbollah in Lebanon. Israel is under weekly attack from the Houthis in Yemen. And last night, we had a fourth front to open up before us, uh, before our eyes from Iran itself. Israel is a country that is under attack and assault on four different fronts. We're a small country, Michael. That's pretty mm -hmm. remarkable. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned the psychological terrorism in addition to the very real terrorism and, and military threat that Iran exports all around the region. And this was a direct Iranian attack on Israel. So is this a new chapter in Middle East history? Well, it's definitely not the shadow war, which was you know my book that came out back in 2012. This is a war that's right before our eyes. It's playing out. This was a direct, unprecedented attack from Iranian territory against the state of Israel, a kinetic attack uh, with hundreds of drones, ballistic missiles, and cruise missiles. And while they were all pretty much intercepted and my, I join your prayers for that young uh, Bedouin girl who was injured from shrapnel that fell in the south. But this was a remarkable success and a testament to the amazing ingenuity and the strength of Israel's missile defense architecture, as well as the regional collective and partnership that, that played out last uh, early this morning with Jordanian and American and British and maybe others who were involved in helping to intercept some of these uh, uh, enemy uh, projectiles as they were making their way towards Israel. But this is an all out war. This is an act of war when you are attacked by a country that has for years, let's remember, been calling to wipe Israel off the map and is pursuing a capability that could give it that opportunity. They want to get nuclear weapons. Now the Iranians are the greatest generator of chaos and bloodshed it probably in the world, right? There are supportive proxies, and we mentioned some of them. Peter spoke about Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis in Yemen, the militias in Iraq, and the support of the Assad regime in Syria. The, the, what we saw last night was Iran unmasking itself, was saying, we're not just about proxies. We, we actually are have no problem attacking Israel. And the question really now that I think Israel has to ask itself, and this is a real difficult dilemma to solve, 
is how do we respond to this attack? Because on the one hand, if we don't respond with force, we potentially, I fear, set ourselves up for another assault like this in a month, in two months, in three months, or maybe even half a year. It basically is similar to what happened when that first Qassam rocket was fired from Gaza. That's when we should have gone into Gaza. Now we know mm -hmm. and taken out all that infrastructure. It took us a long time to figure that out. And we had to wait for 1,200 plus Israelis to be massacred on a single day on October 7th for that wake-up call. We can't allow that to happen again. And that's why we have to respond, in my view, with great strength and resolve so that Iran learns a lesson that this is not acceptable and Israel will not tolerate this type of attack against its territory. And so while Iran waits for that potential response, there was a huge rally in Tehran today to celebrate the attack. They chanted death to America. They chanted death to Israel, all while gas prices soar and their currency plummets. Is it your sense that Iran will be satisfied with what they achieved? Look, the Iranians can say to some extent, you know, we managed to launch the greatest assault on Israel uh, with missiles and with drones that has ever been seen. And, and that's quite impressive. They didn't succeed in, in striking what they would have liked to. And people have argued over the last few hours that they knew that the, all this would be intercepted and therefore they felt that it wouldn't cross a line that would prompt Israel to launch a large scale aerial offensive against Iranian territory. So they gambled a bit and maybe their gamble paid off. And there are people who are trying to say to Israel right now that what Israel did was a win and that with the interception of 99% of all of this weaponry that was fired our way early this morning on Sunday, that the fact that it was all intercepted means we could take a win. I, I totally reject that definition of what happened at about 2 a.m. in Israel, a win. It, it was a success. And Israel successfully, together with its allies, was able to intercept all of that weaponry. But defense itself is not a win. And, you know, I tweeted this earlier, and I don't know if this is the best example, but I grew up in Chicago. Michael Jordan was, you know, our hero as kids. Michael Jordan and the Bulls didn't win all of those championships just because of their defense. They also had to go on the offense once in a while. And, and Israel does need, and we saw what October 7th was for us. It came after years of containment and of a feeling of security that Iron Dome provided us. And Iron Dome is incredible and it has saved countless lives. And this is an opportunity to say thank you to countless, to, to successive U.S. governments and administrations that have provided key funding and support for all of our missile defense systems. But that doesn't provide a victory. That provides a, a sense of security that as we saw on October 7th can be shattered in a second when that enemy refuses to be contained any longer and comes into your homes to rape, murder, and abduct your people. And so the key question, what comes next? There's a danger to responding, and some would argue a greater danger, as you've mentioned, uh, to not responding. So what are Israel's options? The spectrum, I think, is wide, Michael, because on the one hand, we, we could do nothing. This is true, and, and this is what the world is trying to tell us to do, and we're hearing that now from the G7 and the president of the United States, Joe Biden, who I, I think is a friend of Israel, is, is saying to Israel, we're taking this to the UN Security Council, to an emergency session. There's no need. We're going to hit them with diplomacy, and you have the entire global legitimacy today. Everybody understands that Iran is behind all of this. So just sit this one out. So you could do that. But I also think that you have some military options. For example, a striking the bases from which these drones and missiles were launched would be a response that I think would fall within the parameters of a proportional reaction and retaliation to what happened earlier this morning. I'm not saying that what happened needs to uh, conclude in Israel launching a, a widespread strike against Iran's nuclear project and complex and facilities, as well as other infrastructure of military kind and civilian. So I'm not saying we have to go to an all-out war that would almost definitely uh, in, engage also Hezbollah in the north, which is what we're probably mostly afraid of to some extent of what that would mean. But there are different options that Israel has. And I think the next 24 to 48 hours 
will be very interesting to see if Israel is going to do something. Because if it waits beyond the 48-hour window, then it would also, I think, maybe lose the opportunity to respond in kind to what happened. And a response could come later. It could be a cyber attack. It could be a covert operation of some kind. But it would no longer be within the the current engagement that we're finding ourselves in right now. Yeah. I want to put up the front cover, the recent front cover of The Economist magazine. Um, They recently put this on their cover, Israel Alone. Now, since the Iranian attack, uh, we this attack really demonstrated that Israel was very much not alone, didn't it? No, it did, and I, and, and you know it's remarkable, and I think we 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 have to uh, appreciate this moment in time, uh, despite everything I just said. You know the fact that we have all these countries from around the world, whether it's the United States and the British and the French, and uh, you were telling we were talking about Paraguay and Chile and Argentina, everyone around the world, and the whole G seven gathering earlier this evening uh, with President Biden to unequivocally condemn the Iranian aggression and to say that we stand by Israel's right to act in self-defense. But I think as we saw, Michael, and you at Stand With Us, you, you, you guys, this is what you do, right? It's about defending Israel and standing up for Israel around the world uh, and, and, and making sure that the message and the truth gets out there. But I think we both know that They like, the world likes us when we're under attack and they like us when we are unfortunately injured or even killed. They don't like when we stand up and fight back. And we see, we saw how quickly that changed after October 7th, when we started to defend ourselves and, and without getting into too much detail in a way that books will be written about the way the military, the IDF has been fighting inside the Gaza Strip in, in what is probably the most uh, complicated urban terrain ever and battlefield, but with the greatest sensitivity to the civilian population inside Gaza and the numbers of casualties speak for themselves, but the world doesn't stand up and and, and, and appreciate that. And I, I'm afraid that the support we have now will only last as long as we are attacked. The moment we decide to defend ourselves is the moment that all these countries, countries that you're now seeing on the screen mm. are going to uh, unfortunately walk away from us. So important that we continue to bolster that support. And of course, we also had the scene of Israel defending the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Temple Mount. Uh, Let's take a look at that. And I warn our Israeli viewers, you'll hear the sound of red alert sirens. So you have the Iranian regime, which has made so much of Jerusalem as an issue in which to attack Israel over decades, really, um, attacking uh, one of the holiest sites in Islam and certainly the holiest site in Judaism. How will the region look at this moment and this attack in general? I mean, this is the opportunity that we currently find ourselves in, right? What we see is really a remarkable moment in time where the, not only does the whole Western world recognize the violent regime of the Islamic Republic of Iran and, and what it's really about, which is to try to kill as many people in Israel and to try to really uh, undermine, weaken, and even destroy Israel, because that's what they say they want to do, but they have total disregard for what we would have said maybe their own people, right? Uh, it, Muslims and, and the holy sites of the Islam religion. Uh, This is a regime that will stop at nothing to try to achieve its objective of further deteriorating this region. And I think that the Saudis get this. The Egyptians get this. And and, and again, I'll borrow uh, what, what we've been seeing over the last six months with Israel's offensive against Hamas in Gaza. When you look around the world and you look at the countries where those condemnations are coming from, they're mostly coming from North America. They're mostly coming from the United Kingdom. They're mostly coming from Europe. You don't hear the government of Morocco and the Emiratis and the Saudis and the Egyptians getting up every day and condemning the state of Israel and its war against Hamas because they understand what it is we're fighting about for and what we're fighting against. And I think this is also what they now realize about Iran as well. They want us to defeat these enemies. They want to stand with us. 
and we saw that beautiful illustration of this regional cooperation that is, is exists and has even greater potential to come with the way the Jordanian Air Force fought to intercept many of these drones as they were flying through its airspace on its way to Israel. And of course, there is a bigger threat looming. What do we know about Iran's nuclear capability at this time? Well, look, we know that Iran uh, for decades now has been pursuing a nuclear capability. We know based on IAEA reports, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog, that over the last six months under the cover, I would say, of the war in Gaza, they have used this as an opportunity to continue to enrich uranium to higher uh, degrees and higher levels. You need uh, for a military degrade uranium, what would be HEU, high enri highly enriched uranium, you would need 90% enriched. They have now a very significant quantity of uranium that's enriched already to 60% and up, which means within just a matter of maybe a week or two, if not less, they could enrich that uranium to the 90 degree, 90% 90 level, sorry, that would give them what's known as an SQ, a significant quantity for a nuclear device. They still don't have the weapon as far as the Israeli intelligence and other Western intelligence agencies talk about, not that capability of installing a warhead on one of those ballistic missiles that they launched towards Israel earlier this morning. But they have been they've been proceeding and plowing forward with their nuclear program, with everything going on between Israel and Gaza and everything going on in the world. And, and it's a moment to recognize, I think, Michael, that all of the diplomacy that we've seen over the years, whether it was the 2015 JCPOA, the nuclear deal that President Obama pushed through, whether it was the re-engagement by President Biden when he returned, when he was elected, whether it was even Donald Trump who pulled out of the JCPOA, but wasn't successful in filling that vacuum with another deal, a better deal, which he thought he would be able to push through. Sanctions and the diplomacy that the West has been putting on the Iranians has yet to deliver what I think we all want, which is an end to their nuclear program, an end to their violence and their support of terrorist proxies throughout the region. And, and, and just one last thing, by the way, and I think we saw this early this morning at about 2 a.m., the, the, one of the big flaws that Israel has for years spoken about when it comes to the 2015 JCPOA was that it dealt it did nothing to their development of ballistic missiles. And we saw what those ballistic missiles can do. They mm -hmm. can fly towards Israel. And if they had not been intercepted by our amazing Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 ballistic missile defense systems, they would have killed people here in Israel. So this is th there are many flaws with the approach uh, until now, with the way the West has been granting Iran immunity for too many years and way too long. And finally, you mentioned our daughters are serving together in the IDF as we speak. Uh, we very much wish success to the men and women of the IDF, but it's a very changed army now post October the 7th. Um, what does the future hold for Israel Defense Forces? Look, the Israeli military has really, despite the failures that led to October 7th and the failures that we saw on October 7th, the failure to learn and to gather that uh, intelligence ahead of time and the warning of what Hamas was planning to do, the failure of the barriers and the defensive measures that we had put in place along the Gaza border to stop an infiltration and an attack of this kind, and the failure of the IDF to stop them once they had crossed in. These, were, these are all things that will have to be fixed, investigated, and, and I will assume that heads will eventually roll at that top level of the general staff, but when I look on the ground and I look at the soldiers themselves and I look at the way that the IDF has been fighting in Gaza, first of all, just one word about the interoperability, the way that the ground forces and the Air Force and the Navy and everyone has been working together really in an unprecedented way that militaries around the world are already coming here to learn and to study. The way that they've adapted and improvised, which is long too, for a long time, have been two of the strongest traits of the Israeli military and its ability to adapt to new threats and to the change in the region and to the, the threats that we face along our borders. But also, I have to say one word about the courage and the bravery of our soldiers. I've long thought since October 7th, and I, I assume you'll agree with me that, you know, when I think to the Tanakh, to the Old Testament, I think of the, the book of Judges, which is the book 
that really tells the stories of, of amazing heroes of the, of the Jewish people in ancient time, there's a need for a new book of Judges. There's a need for a new book of the heroes of October 7th and the heroes that we've seen in the last six months of people, young folks, men and women willing to put their lives on the line to, to keep our country safe is something that every day moves me anew. Absolutely. We are lucky to have them uh, doing incredible work, and we've seen it up and down the country. Yaakov Katz, thank you so much for your analysis and for your time today. We appreciate it very thank much. You. And a wonderful presentation coming up right now in a moment. But before we do, don't forget that you can stay up to date with all that's happening in Israel by clicking on the subscribe button on Stand With Us YouTube. And you can help Stand With Us get the word out with the leading force for Israel on social media. You can help us grow even more by donating at standwithus.com slash donate. Now, before we go, many of us remember and miss the late, great Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who was a true friend and supporter of the work of Stand With Us. Well, now, together with the Rabbi Sachs legacy, we've made a new video featuring archive footage of a speech that he gave to a pro-Israel rally in London back in 2002. It was inspiring, and I know because I was there. And as you'll see, the video is interspersed with footage, including from the last six months, and it is as relevant as ever. Take a look. We have come together from all shades of the political spectrum, all shades of the religious spectrum, to say to our brothers and sisters in the country we love, Israel, you are not alone. You have been doubly afflicted by a campaign of terror on your streets and a campaign of calumny in the media of the world. You feel bewildered, distressed, assaulted and alone and therefore we say to you when you suffer we suffer your grief is ours your fears your prayers your hopes are ours and we say to you with all the love we feel you will never be alone israel is not alone <laughs> friends let me tell you what israel means to me it was brought into being after the worst crime of man against man, after 2,000 years of exile and suffering. And I am humbly proud to be part of a people that said, Old law of the Tikvatenu. We never gave up hope. We said in the words of the Psalm, Lo Amut Kiev, yeah, we will not die, we will live in the face of death, Israel's sanctified life. Israel did not rage in anger against the world. It got on with the simple business of building a future for its children, a tiny little place somewhere in this world where after more affliction than any people has ever known, Jewish people could live in peace, in safety, without fear of being attacked, injured, murdered, just because they were Jews. Israel, I am proud of what you did. And because you sought a place of peace, because in all our prayers we speak of peace, all you ever sought was peace. Menachem Begin gave up Sinai for the sake of peace. Shimon Peres went to Oslo to negotiate peace. Yitzhak Rabin gave his life for the sake of peace. Ehud Barak offered the Palestinians a state the whole of Gaza, 97% of the West Bank, in return for peace. Israel, I am proud of what you did. No country, no country in the world could live with what you have lived with, least of all a country dedicated to the preservation of life, to the sanctity of life to see bombs planted in buses outside schools, to see worshippers murdered, to see grandparents, to see little children murdered in cold blood day after day until no one could walk the streets or enter a shop without fear. Could any country, would any country live like this? Is the world really saying, 
Is the world really saying that every country in the world has a right to self-defense except Israel? No, Israel, I weep at what you have had to suffer. And yet I know that even now, after everything, all you want is peace. Friends, let the voice of peace sound louder than the noise of war. I want to ask Israel's critics, tell me, who offered Palestinian children a future? Its neighbors who from 1948 to 67 controlled Gaza and the West Bank and kept the refugee Palestinians in refugee camps so that they could be exploited and used as pawns in a war against Israel. The Iranians, do they care for Palestinian children when they send them guns instead of food? To Middle East countries who use Palestinians to deflect criticism from their regimes of brutality and oppression. Where was the United Nations condemnation of them? The only country to offer Palestinian children a future is Israel. Israel, I am proud of what you did. I want to say to the Palestinians, your children deserve a future. We beg you, don't teach them to hate those with whom they must one day learn to live. We beg you, don't teach them to commit suicide for the sake of shedding innocent blood. They deserve better than to see violence and suffering. For what? For what? All it needed all you ever wanted you could have had with one word all it needed was one word from your leader to the terrorists and the suicide bombers saying stop one word but that word never came and still it doesn't come and because of that your children are seeing their future torn up before their eyes when the so-called friends of palestinians use them I am proud that Israel alone offered Palestinian children a future. Israel, I am proud of what you did. From nothing, from nothing, you created one of the great economies of the world. From Iran, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Russia, Romania, from 103 countries, you rescued endangered Jews and you gave them a home. When any country ever turned to you for help, when the Muslims from Bosnia, from Kosovo, from Turkey asked for your help, you were there bringing a medical aid, humanitarian aid. We say to the people of Israel, we are proud of what you have achieved. Israel, you have taken a barren land and made it bloom again. You have taken an ancient nation and made it young again. You have taken a shattered people and made it stand tall again. Israel, you are not alone. The powerful words of the late Rabbi Sachs, may his memory be a blessing, and those words resonate as much today as ever. Israel, we are proud of you. At this anxious time, we're sending support to the IDF and love to our brothers and sisters and allies worldwide, and our prayers for every single hostage to be back home with their family soon. Together, we will prevail. Thanks for watching. Am Yisrael Chai.